is Heather Hauer, who is outreach educator for our project. And then, of course, our presenter, Arlene Lev. I'm going to ask Heather uh, to spend a couple of minutes um, explaining the operating instructions for our webinar. Thank you for joining today's presentation. Before we get started, I'm going to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. You have joined today's meeting either by telephone or by listening through your computer speakers. If you can listen to music on your computer, you will be able to hear today's presentation. If you would like to call in using the phone, just locate your audio panel and select Use Telephone. The dial information and access code will then be displayed. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions to our staff through the questions pane. Simply type your question and hit send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a Q&A session to answer as many questions as we have time for. The Lesbian and Gay Family Building Project is dedicated to assisting LGBTQ people in upstate New York achieve their goals of building and sustaining healthy families. Our network of more than 500 Pride and Joy families provides social and educational opportunities and a much needed sense of community to LGBTQ parents, prospective parents, and their children. The project was founded in April of 2000 with a grant from the New York State Department of Health. Um, I'd like now to introduce our speaker, Arlene Lev. Arlene is Founder and Clinical Director of Choices Counseling and Consulting. She's also Clinical Director of the Training Institute for Gender Relationships, Identity, and Sexuality. She's part-time on the faculties of Empire College and the University of Albany School of Social Welfare. Um, she's one of the founders of the SOGI Project, which is a new initiative at the University at Albany that supports clinical training in LGBT issues. Ari is also the clinical supervisor of the Pride Center, uh, Center Support Counseling, and on the editorial board of the Journal of GLBT Family Studies and the International Journal of Transgenderism. Ari uh, is a, a good friend and a wonderful speaker, um, and I'm happy to have you, Ari. Hi, Claudia, and hi, everybody out there. It's kind of a strange experience talking to 86 people in my little office, but I'm really happy to be here and doing this with you. So um, I appreciate very much um, Claudia's introduction. My first response when I hear all of that is I'm just too tired to do this right now. Um, from doing all that other stuff. Um, but I want to I wanna talk a little bit, if I can, just about my work, because doing this program today, Gender and LGBTQ Families, brings together a number of issues in my life, a number of areas that I work in. Um, so I want to start by talking about the fact that I'm a feminist therapist. And, you know, we have a little joke um, in academia these days that F, the feminism has become the F word. Um, but I come to my initial work as a therapist with a feminist perspective. And from that work, began to work with lesbian and gay couples, lesbian and gay families, people planning families, doing uh, home studies, uh, fertility work. And then in the last 15 or 20 years, I've been doing a lot of work as a gender specialist, working with trans people. Um, I work with clients as young as five, dealing with um, gender nonconformity or gender dysphoria in some cases, and uh, do a lot of work with their parents who are often heterosexual couples who are really struggling with what this might mean. So these various areas in my life, uh, being a feminist, uh, working, and, uh, working and living in the gay and lesbian community, working with trans people, um, and working with people uh, negotiating gender and sexuality in their relationships, just sort of brings together um, these areas of my life, um, uh, kind of like all these overlapping Venn diagrams. So um, I, I just wanted to briefly mention, I have two books that I wrote. 
uh, one called Transgender Emergence, which is a book uh, for therapists working with gender variant people, and um, the Lesbian and Gay Parenting Guide, which actually deals a lot with gender and sexuality issues, although um, uh, Penguin Press was too, uh, too scared, I think, to put that on the cover of the book. Uh, it was supposed to be called How Queer, but I guess they couldn't, they couldn't stand that. So um, I have two books, and I also have two children. So those are my kids, just so you know that I'm authentic and uh, know a little bit about what it is to be in the trenches with this issue. So although I have all this educational background, I really think 90% of what I've learned has been um, being a part of and witnessing these children's lives. So LGBTQ families, you know, in many ways, we are a kind of social experiment. And I'm not saying, obviously, queer people have always had children. But there has never, ever been a time in history when so many self-identified, same-sex, queer-gendered people are having children, rearing children, living in family units where they're out and they're proud. So as a vanguard, um, and some of you here may be listening and thinking, I'm not a pioneer. I don't want to be a pioneer. But we are pioneers in many ways. And we're pioneers in a somewhat hostile environment. Um, some of us have had to really fight for our rights to become parents. We've had to fight to legalize our partnerships. And even though things are good in New York State, better than in most places in the country, um, that you know our children in this state, we can have both of our children's names on their birth certificates, that we can get married now. Um, many of us, and I know that some of you listening are from rural parts of the state or the country, we're often the first family like ours in the daycare, in the school. And this experience of being in a goldfish bowl creates a kind of pressure to be the perfect family. And um, I, my experience, I'm the mother of a 16 and 11 year old, is that as our children grow, that experience increases and it also increases for our children, meaning they're feeling that pressure. And I wanted to start with that uh, perspective for us because I think that gender is one of the key pivotal issues in our struggles with this goldfish bowl, the pressure to fit in. So some of you listening um, may be people that are very conventionally gendered. Um, many LGBT people are very conventionally gendered. Or perhaps not. Perhaps you're a person who's not so conventional in how you present yourself. We may be people who reject stereotypes, who um, purposely say, um, you know, gay men or lesbians are not like those stereotypes. Or we may be people who reflect those stereotypes, either because we identify with them or simply because that's how it is. Just being ourselves in the world um, makes people want to look at us and say that person is gay or that person is lesbian. I'm going to be talking a lot about this phrase, just like you, or just like straight people. So many of us feel like our families are just like straight families. There's really no difference. Or it may be that you don't feel we're just like you. So I think this is something when we open up the questions later, I'd like to focus on a little bit. But I think that most of us have complex relationships to gender, our own gender, as well as other people in our communities. I find that we both deny and also celebrate our gender variance. That sometimes, you know, we're in this place of saying there is nothing different about us. And other times, you know, we are joking about uh, butch femme, or we're joking about, you know, you can tell he's gay. <clears throat> and we kind of celebrate these parts of our community. Um, Sometimes gay men have internalized a kind of negative social view of, quote, effeminate men. Lipstick lesbians surely have been embraced by the mainstream culture in a way that sort of good old-fashioned dykes have never been. We tend to ignore the T in the LGBT. And even within the trans community, there's all kinds of smaller sub-communities. Transsexuals are embarrassed by the behavior of cross-dressers, or trans men and butches sort of arguing about the border wars where one identity ends and another identity begins. So I want to just 
focus. Um, the, there's four items that I'm going to spend most of this time talking about regarding gender. How the gender identity of parents influences their children. How children develop typical or atypical gender identities. Questions of trans parents or trans parenting and gender roles within same-sex couples who are parenting together. The question from the outsider saying, who's the mommy or which one of you is the real mommy? So I just want to start with some definitions. Um, <clears throat> I'm using the term gender identity um, in the sense that we all have one. Everyone has a gender identity. How we see ourselves as a man or as a woman, as a boy or as a girl in the and that is, dis that is different from gender expression, which is how we dress or how we move in the world, how we carry ourselves and present ourselves, uh, what some people call our performance. And all of us perform gender. Every one of us chooses the clothes we wear, the kind of hair we have, uh, whether or not we wear earrings, whether or not we wear makeup, whether or not we wear skirts, dresses, or pants, uh, the part of the department store that we shop in. And we send a message out to the world about how we're seen in terms of our gender expression. And it is obvious to people in the world when gender expression is stepping out of the category considered normative. So I just want to, in keeping with definitions, just make a clear distinction between sexual orientation and uh, gender identity. Sexual orientation is about who you, um, oh, isn't that funny that came out wrong on the title, who you go to bed with, that's supposed to say. Sexual orientation is about who you go to bed with. And gender identity is about who you go to bed as. And I'm borrowing that from my friend Diane Ehrensaft, who has a new, brand new book, Hot Off the Press Out, um, on uh, working with children uh, who are gender variant. Um, so who you go to bed with versus who you go to bed as. Gender identity is about who we are. I often say you would have a gender identity on an island all by yourself, although sexual, sexual identity becomes a little less clear in a situation where there's nobody else there. Um, gender roles about how we dress and move through the world. And I have this picture that I just clipped from the internet. Maybe some of you know this family. I don't. Um, but clearly, these two moms are expressing a very different sense of their gender role in the world. Um, and you can see that just in a picture in terms of how they're dressed, the clothes they're wearing, the way they wear their hair. So these parts of self also overlap. People tend to think other people are gay because they act uh, more masculine or more feminine than others assigned to that sex. And it's not just gay people that do that. It's not just straight people that do this. Gay people do this um, to one another. You know, and I'm sure you've heard people say, oh, everybody knows Bob is gay. He just hasn't come out yet. You can tell. And what is it that we're telling? And I think often what that is is about gender, not really about sexual orientation. Sometimes it's hard to read someone's gender identity by their gender role. Sometimes it's hard to tell what pronoun somebody would prefer you use just by looking at them. Um, and sometimes, and I see this clinically maybe more than you see this socially, but people are confused. You know, if I like boys, then I must be a girl. In a world where homophobia is so present, uh, people struggle a lot to understand what is about their gender and what is about their sexuality. And lastly, for some people, it's hard to know their sexual orientation if their gender identity is not really stable. That's something we see a lot is that sometimes when people transition their gender, suddenly their sexual orientation changes, or in sometimes it just becomes very clear to them in a way that it was muddier before. So gender in some ways is the elephant in the room. Um, we sort of avoid talking about it. I find that people minimize gender nonconforming expression in kind of odd ways. Um, the neighbor who says, oh, I never saw you as masculine. Really, you never did? And they don't realize that it's actually an insult to say that I'm not seeing your gender. People confuse gender roles with sexual orientation. Do you think he's gay, a friend says to the parent of the boy who's playing dress up? And that little boy playing dress up is my little boy um, with his first attempt to put on lipstick. 
So sexual orientation and gender identity. Much of the oppression that I think we experience as same-sex couples is really oppression about gender. It's really uh, people being uncomfortable with our gender presentations. And the focus of discrimination and hostility against our family has really revolved around these two issues. Will our children be gay? And will our children have the right role models to be correctly gendered as boys and girls, men and women? Now I'm going to focus most of my conversation on the second question about gender, but I do want to spend a minute on the first question um, about gay. And I, that is my children playing dress up a long time ago. So. Um, just so you know what we're dealing with here in my house. OK. So the fear. Will our children be queer? So there's been a tremendous amount of research <clears throat> excuse me, on this subject. Um, Charlotte Patterson, Annette Gartrell, Susan Golem back in the UK. Um, everybody wants to know. Researchers want to know. Clinicians want to know. Politicians want to know. Adoption workers want to know. Everybody has wanted to know. So a lot of money and time has been put into this research. So sexual orientation first. Is there an increase in homosexual identity for children with gay or lesbian parents? Do gay parents make gay kids? And the answer, as I'm sure most of you know, is according to the research, the vast majority of children raised by lesbian and gay parents grow up to be heterosexual. Now I have two questions. My first question is, is this good news? Is it bad news? if our kids are gay? Is it bad news if our kids are queer? Have we failed in some way? And if we're thinking it's bad news, what does that say about how we feel about ourselves as LGBT people? And what do you think would have happened if this research showed that 98% of our kids were gay? I mean, the research showed that most of our kids are straight. So therefore, you're allowed to have your kids. But do you think that we would have the families we do right now if the research had shown that, yes, when gay people, when same-sex couples, when LGBT people have children, all of their kids are as queer, as my mother would say, as a $3 bill? So second question is, is it true? We have a number of kids now who are identifying as second generation, gay kids of gay parents. They refer to themselves sometimes as queer spawn, although I've seen that make a bunch of uh, grown-up squirm sometimes. It seems that to a large number of the children of friends of mine, meaning LGBT couples, uh, friends that I know that, that have had children at the same time that I've had children, are identifying as, let us say, not so straight. So. I just want to stop for a second. Um, I have written an article about this called How Queer, the Development of Gender Identity and Sexual Orientation in LGBTQ-Headed Families. Um, it's on my website, so you can access it. It's much more academic than this conversation, but if anybody's interested in it, I want you to know that that's there. So queer spawn. Now, I want to be really clear. My goal here is not to be challenging the research or these researchers. Um, my goal is that I'm wondering about that fishbowl I talked about before. I'm what, wondering what questions people did not ask. I'm wondering what pressure there was on the parents, but also the children, to be a certain way, to have certain answers. So much has rested on this research, um, and we as a community celebrated this research. But I wonder what pressure there was. You know, some of you may remember, um, I, uh, I think his name is Zach. Uh, there's a big YouTube video of this young man in um, Iowa who is uh, talking to the legislature there about um, his gay parents, and um, it kind of went viral, you know, on the internet. And I shared it with my 16-year-old son, who didn't have the reaction I thought he would have. The reaction all the other parents had: "Oh, what a wonderful boy! What a great thing!" His reaction was. I don't want the pressure to have to be a spokesperson for my family. So we have to look at that. What is the pressure? It's because of this research that we have the families we do, but I don't think it's the whole story. And this becomes, I think, increasingly relevant, talking about gender. So how does the gender identity of parents influence children? Are children 
who are reared by same-sex parents more likely to have an atypical gender identity. Our boys, are our boys, less masculine and our girls less feminine? Can our being queer influence the gender development, i.e. the masculinity and femininity of our children? Can it? So there's some assumptions here. The assumption is that gay and lesbian people sort of have odd gender identities. I mean, why else would our gender impact our children in a negative way if there wasn't something odd about us? And that gay and lesbian people don't know the correct gender behavior. You know, as if we didn't grow up in the same social world as everyone else. You know, I always refer to that as the pumpkin patch. Like somehow, you know, I, I somehow grew up in a pumpkin patch and I don't know what the rules are of the rest of the world because I'm queer. And that our odd genders will somehow confuse our children. So that if our children are not being reared by typical <clears throat> heteronormative moms and dads, they will somehow grow up confused. So what does the research say? So the same research says children of lesbian mothers fell within conventional norms of sex type behavior. I just want to say the reason it says lesbian mothers is because most of the research has been on lesbian mothers. We're just beginning to develop research now on gay dads, and there has not been very much research at all on bi or trans parents. So that's why this says lesbian mothers. Children of lesbian mothers showed no differences in their gender development, either their gender identity or their gender role, that there's no evidence of gender identity confusion or atypical gender behavior, no differences between the children in lesbian and heterosexual families for either boys or girls. So we could raise all those same questions. Is this good news? Not a single study found the children of lesbian and gay people had any negative effects, any at all. And this research has been instrumental in changing laws to support our families, custody battles, adoption decisions, etc. But this heteronormativity, the research justifies same-sex parenting based on scientific affirmations of normality. In other words, they're saying it's OK for lesbians and gay men, by, extent, by extension bisexual and transgender people, to parent children because our children are just like the children of heterosexual marriages. So we're being compared against a norm that is decidedly unqueer. Go forth and multiply, they say, as long as you reproduce the status quo. Like all parents, LGBT people are expected to socialize our children in appropriate gender behaviors. We can ask why the gender binary is so important and why it's assumed that same sex and transgender parents will fail at this task. So here's the answer. Um, you may know this guy. Um, what you may not know, just a little footnote to our story here, is that um, Freud's granddaughter is a lesbian and a social worker. Um, they're Sigmund. So how many of you see yourself as a Freudian? I suspect none of you. Um, well, if you're worried about your kid's gender development at all, it might be Freud's influence. Most psychological theories of gender identity have their roots in Freudian-based psychoanalytic theory. Freud suggested that we were all psychically bisexual. And he doesn't mean the word bisexual the way we do. He doesn't mean you like both men and women. He means bisexual in the sense that we have a male and female self. Um, what Jung referred to as the anima and the animus. So we're all psychically bisexual. But to become a boy or to become a girl, we have to be properly socialized. And that happens when children identify with their same sex parent. Healthy gender development means that we're essentially cleansing ourselves of the other gender and repressing one's natural bisexuality. And please remember, this is Freud talking not me. In order to grow into be a healthy male, to have a healthy male identity, boys have to learn to separate from their mothers and identify with their fathers. And girls have to learn to become like their mothers and, of course, desire their fathers. The outcome of normal gender identity development is this heterosexual attraction, this joining of opposites. So I've made something 
very complicated into something, of course, very simple uh, to do this in a time frame. But what's important to understand is that both homosexuality and transgender expression are considered developmental arrests caused by faulty early parenting, particularly mothering, because mothers, of course, get blamed for everything. So same-sex parents don't have two opposite-sex parents to give to their children. And I recognize here, of course, and I just want to say it, that some of us are single parents, so we, there is only one parent of one sex. So how can a parent who defies traditional gender roles teach them to their children? And again, I recognize that not everyone is defying them. Some of us um, are relatively traditional in our gender role, but perhaps have two parents who represent the same traditional gender role. If a child has two butch moms or two dads, what are the messages that child is getting about gender? What is the message a boy child is getting with two butch moms? What is the um, message a girl child is getting who has two butch moms? So heteronormativity. Um, some of the messages that we get caused by heteronormativity that children parented by men are thought to suffer from a lack of mothering, as if only women had skills to, nur to nurture, and as if um, all women had skills to nurture. And I'm sure many of you know some women who are just not very nurturing. Gay men are sort of assumed to be, and again, I'm talking by mainstream society, to be hypersexual child molesters who are unable to care for children, that they're too narcissistic, first of all, to take care of children. They're too sexually involved to take care of children. And they just don't have the caring um, that being men makes them sort of not women, in the sense that they're not able to mother. And indeed, in an odd way, approval for foster and adoption for gay men has been based on this interesting narrative that gay men are different from straight men, that they're actually more maternal, that they're less masculine than straight men and therefore more maternal. So somehow being gay men, um, you know, on one hand, hypersexual sex offenders, and on the other hand, gentle, sweet, motherly-like, therefore it'll be okay to let them parent. Lesbians, on the other hand, are accused of being militant, anti-male feminists, um, i.e. they're harmful to their male children. Or, on the other hand, they're especially safe caregivers because they are, after all, two loving, nurturing moms. So I think society goes sort of back and forth in first this very negative position, um, but even when they turn it into a positive position, it is highlighting these gender stereotypes. And um, again, the, uh, the family you're seeing on the right, uh, the family on the left is just exhausted. So, but the family on the right that you're seeing, um, the butch mom with um, her kid, um, again, I don't know this family, but the uh, caption underneath it on the internet, uh, apparently this is a Halloween party and that's her son uh, dressed up. So I just want to be uh, officially on record, my, uh, uh, using all of the weight of my credentials, to say that that's poppycock. Um, we know that gender varies from culture to culture. Male-female expression is not simply biological. And yet we know that gender is also deeply biologically rooted. So we have this kind of interesting and odd um, uh, balance beam. We go back and forth in our culture where gender is seen as both innate and something that needs to be taught. In other words, we all know that, um, that gender is something that is uh, programmed in our XY and XX genes. And yet somehow the message is there that if we as gay parents don't teach our children to be proper men and women, proper boys and girls, that they won't become that. It's so lots of mixed messages, so which one is it? Is it nature or is it nurture? We are often uncomfortable, I'm sorry, we're often comfortable, many of us are comfortable 
when we watch our little boys rock their baby dolls to sleep. But we may be uncomfortable when little boys want to wear baby doll pajamas to bed. We may celebrate ways that our children are um, genderly different as long as they don't stray too much. We may encourage girls to play soccer, but flinch if the same girl wants to wear a man tailored suit to a family wedding. Some of you may be familiar with the little boy um, on the picture who um, uh, uh, wanted to dress up, uh oh, I'm forgetting her name, as Daphne from the Scooby-Doo um, um, uh, cartoon. And the mom led her and then made a post, uh, led him rather, and made a post uh, on her blog that went viral with people having all kinds of strong feelings about um, why a mother shouldn't let a boy dress up as a girl. And I think my favorite line she said, and I'm totally paraphrasing her, but she said something like, you know, my son is no more likely to grow up to be a girl because he dressed this way for Halloween than your son is likely to become a vampire. And I thought that was just a wonderful way of looking at that, that, you know, uh, although, you know, those of us here into depth psychology might find it interesting what people choose to dress up as and what it means. Um, I don't think we usually psychoanalyze our children's choice of costume. And uh, yet, however, a boy to dress up as a girl becomes an issue. So are we uncomfortable? It may be equally challenging to have little girls love frills and pink as it is to have them reject all things feminine. And I've heard my friends say that, that you know they are kind of too uh, run-of-the-mill, everyday sort of dykes who don't um, don't wear dresses, don't dress up very feminine, don't wear makeup, don't wear, don't have long nails, and yet they have a little daughter who is so feminine, loves everything pink, and it's equally as uncomfortable as it is to have the little girl be dressing up as a boy. We may be equally uncomfortable with our son's desire to join the military or play football as we are with his expressed desire to wear a skirt. So if you um, see this picture here, um, that's a little boy uh, playing with his Barbie and Ken. And you may notice that Ken is wearing um, a lovely blue uh, uh, dress for the prom. So you know, sometimes they say, you know, it's OK for you gay people to have kids um, as long as you give your kids opposite sex role models. And I just want us to look at that for a minute. You know, the idea that every child needs a male role model seems in some ways to suggest that any model of maleness is preferable to no models of maleness. And just makes me wonder, you know, why do we need a male role model or a, a female role model? As if the world is not full of men and women that children can role model off of, as if they don't have the media in front of them. Um, you know, that it's so important to have the presence of a male that it supersedes the quality of his parenting. So again, I want to be on record. I don't think kids need men or need women or need grandmothers, although all of those things can be very lovely things to have. Um, I often say, you know, I was raised by my grandparents, and I know many people are not particularly close to their uh, grandparents. I know that some kids don't have grandmothers and grandfathers. And, uh, you know, to me, that's hard. I can't imagine not having a nana that I had who loved me so much. Um, kids don't need any of those. What they need is people who love them and recognizing that all of our families are somewhat diverse. So um, as I was putting this together last week, uh, Rick Santorum, uh, was said, and some of you may have heard this, that even fathers in jail who had abandoned their kids were still better than no father at all to have in their children's lives. Um, if same-sex couples were to raise, if, if a same-sex couple were to raise a child, they would be robbing children of something they need, they deserve, they have a right to. So I want you to notice these words out there. Now, some of you may be saying, you know, well, Rick Santorum is a jerk, and I don't listen to that. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that uh, his opinions on, a, on some level have very little to do with my life. But this is a man who's running for president. You know, that what does it mean that something like this can be, even be said on a national agenda? Okay. 
So how are we influenced by these views? Well, I find, again, I'm talking as a therapist, that people question whether their children are being hurt by not having two opposite sex parents. I would say that's a relatively common question I get. I get emails. I get Facebook questions about that. I get uh, families coming in who are thinking about becoming parents and wondering, how will this affect my children? What will happen to my children? For some families, they reinforce normative roles um, in a kind of strong way that the, that the lesbian couple has a son and the son is doing something that some people view as more feminine. And they're more repressive about it. They're more concerned about it because, again, there is that fishbowl we talked about, that sense that people are looking in. Or perhaps in some ways they're ashamed of their own atypical gender expression when the child says, you know, mommy, how come you wear men's shirts? Um, and this is especially true if the child is expressing atypical gender behavior. There's a fear that this is my fault. So what does it mean when a child exhibits cross-gender behavior? So lesbian, gay, bisexual adults often, although not universally, report cross-gender behavior in their own childhoods. Research has shown over and over again that when LGBT people retrospectively look at their childhoods, they remember a lot of cross-gender behavior. It's actually the kind of thing, you know, that you know, gay people joke about, you know, at parties after a couple of drinks, that oftentimes, you know, people will show pictures, they'll bring pictures into clinical sessions and show me pictures of themselves at four, five, six years old, looking particularly butch or looking particularly sissy-like if, if they're a man, almost as a joke to show me, look, look, I was always gay. You can tell that I was always gay because of my cross-gender behavior. However, Cross-gender behavior, um, it, the question is, is does cross-gender behavior uh, indicate uh, uh, potential uh, identity as an adult, as a gay or lesbian person? And interesting, interestingly enough, research shows that it does. About 80%, according to the research, and the research has problems, I'll talk about that, but according to the research, about 80% of, um, of, of grown-ups um, have 80% of children with cross-gender expression grew up to identify as gay. <clears throat> now, many other children outgrow the behavior. Um, but the question it raises for us is how many kids who are cross-gendered actually grow up to identify as transgender? And the truth is we don't know that right now. We don't have answers to that. This is an emerging population. Um, Five years ago, I had never received one phone call from a family that had a kid uh, exhibiting gender nonconforming behavior. And right now, we have 16 families that we're working with. And um, I'd say it is <clears throat> the second most common phone call that we get is parents, often heterosexual parents, reaching out for assistance with cross-gender children. So no one knows how many of these children will grow up to be trans trans-identified. But surely there are more options for these outcomes than there ever were before, which gets back to the research. So although 80% of the kids in this research grew up to be gay identified, that was taking place 20 years ago. Uh, before there were options, before the options for adult transgender people were as broad as they are now, but very much before the options were available for young children. Um, there are children who are living cross-gendered at young ages today. There are children who are socially transitioning at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. And certainly there are trans youth who are coming out and living cross-gendered lives, cross-gendered meaning from their natal birth sex. Um, so the options are there, and I suspect that that 80% figure is going to look very different when we do the research in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And, of course, many trans adults, just like many gay and lesbian people, say they knew when they were very little. So I'd love to have an answer for you. I'd love to be able to say, oh, I know that gender nonconforming children will have uh, such and such an outcome. But the truth is, is we just don't know that right now. Um, what we do know is that all children experience pressure to comply with the demands of conventional gender norms. That's true for kids that are gender typical 
as well as those that are not. So what I mean is that in some ways it's easy to look at the seven-year-old boy who loves to wear uh, a pink ballet dress around the house and wants to grow his hair long and um, develops a uh, pet feminine name that he likes to use and says, I'm going to grow up someday to be a mommy. It's easy for us as grown-ups to see this child as being under uh, pressure to conform and dealing with a society that is not going to be easily accepting and um, it's probably very anxiety producing for us. However, the little boy who appears to be gender normative, who's wearing his flannel shirts and his jeans and never talks about wanting to be a girl and seems to play with the appropriate uh, superheroes uh, toys and uh, spends his day wanting to play video games, we don't see that kid as struggling around gender. And I think it's important for us to recognize that that kid is experiencing the same pressure to comply that, that the other little boy is having. Um, it may be easier for him to comply, or it may just go underground. It may actually be harder for him than it is for the other child. So I think we need to move away from seeing this as a problem only for gender atypical children and not a problem on a social level for all children. Despite feminism, despite the increased flexibility of adults' social roles, uh, especially in the Western world, despite the great, greater visibility of lesbian and gay adults and couples, um, gender stereotypes for children have remained very constant. Uh, if you, all you have to do is go into Toys R Us and see that there is boys toys and there are girl toys. There are boy clothes and there are girl clothes. I was uh, recently at my kids' elementary school and I was walking down the hall and uh, a group of sec second graders were coming down the hall and I was really shocked, really quite taken back. All of the girls, they of course were in lines, boys on one side, girls on the other, and the girl line looked like a pink and purple um, fairy doll display. I mean, everything was pink, everything was purple, everything was frilly, everything was feathery, and the boys were these blue and brown and black drab clothes. So uh, gender roles are very intense for young children. So the only real question I think we have is how do we support our children regardless of the outcome, whether or not we're looking at a kid who is going to be gay, going to be trans, going to be heterosexual, going to be gender normative, going to be gender atypical. How do we support all of our children? So trans and qu gender queer parents, although trans parents cross gender lines, and I'm thinking specifically of a parent who comes out during their, their child's childhood, um, the truth is, is many trans parents are very traditionally gendered. They're not gender queer at all. They're very traditional. Other trans and genderqueer parents explore the edges of gender. Um, this is a picture here of Del LaGrace Volcano um, getting married. Um, and um, uh, I think that the question of uh, should I use male pronouns, should I use female pronouns, um, what's the best way to refer to this person? I just actually asked Del um, on Facebook about an hour ago, what would you prefer? And the answer was uh, complex, would probably take up half of, my, half of my talk. But the point is, is that some of us have very complex genders. So how does, it, how does that little girl in the picture affected by, um, by the grown-ups in her life? And I'm assuming it's a her and the little girl. Um, some lesbian couples are also butch femme identified and also cross societal gender rules. Uh, we have a famous st uh, story in my family where my son was about three or four years old and my partner was getting dressed and he looked over at her as she was putting on her clothes and he said, are you, this is what he said, he said, you are a girl, right? And she said, right. And he said, just checking. And of course what he was checking was that she tends to wear more uh, boy clothing than what would most people consider would be girl clothing. So how does this influence our children's gender identity, or does it? Or does it? How do we actually incorporate, or in some cases subvert, gender in our intimate relationships is not really well known 
And it's not known because researchers are not asking questions about that. Almost in an odd way, the questions are not there. We don't really know how queer people do gender. Because, as I said earlier, we tend not to talk a lot about this. So I want to share with you a little bit more about the research. Um, Stacy and Biblars um, did a retrospective study um, in 2001 where they looked back on the research that I talked about earlier. And they were kind of confused because it seemed to them that it just didn't seem plausible that there would be no significant differences between LGBTQ parents and heterosexual parents. They said it was an implausible outcome. So they went back and they dove into that research and kind of uh, unpacked it a little bit. And what they found is that some studies found that the children of lesbian mothers showed a wider range of sex type behavior and were found to be less constrained by gender roles. Now, you know, when I, whenever I share this information with people, I always want to sort of say, and that's okay with me, you know, check, you know, right on. I mean, I want my children to have a greater range of sex type behavior and to be less constrained by gender roles. They found that daughters of lesbian mothers were less traditional in, tr in dress and activities and more likely to have career aspirations that were not confined to stereotypical feminine occupations. And again, that sounds great to me. Sorry about that. My voice is getting very dry. I had to drink something. They found that sons of lesbian mothers were less aggressive than those raised in heterosexual households. And I just want to say, amen to that. That's great. But interestingly enough, children of lesbian and gays were often also shown to have a greater sense of openness to homoerotic relationships. And I want to say this part carefully. I'm not saying that the children of lesbian and gay parents are more likely to be lesbian or gay. What we find is that they were equally likely to experience same-sex attraction as the kids of heterosexual parents. But they were more open to considering the possibility of a same-sex relationship. And more of them had actually had such an experience although they did not necessarily identify as gay. And you know, that makes some kind of intuitive sense to me. I mean, if you're growing up in a home with two dads, and you see two dads in a loving relationship your entire childhood, it would not be as different or odd or strange as it might be for a kid growing up in a straight home who had not never seen that or rarely seen it. So of course you would be more open to it, because none of the fears about it would be present for you. Okay, So what I want to say is that disappearing the differences in LGBTQ families does not make for a more liberal and accepting society, but it actually cre it creates invisibility for the children of LGBTQ people, particularly children who may identify themselves as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, or genderqueer themselves. So. You know, we've disappeared the differences because, again, if we're like you, then it's OK to let us parent. So what happens if we say we're not like you? And actually, in some ways, we're very different from you. And sometimes, maybe in higher numbers than we thought, our children are really just like us, too. So you know, Susan Gollenbeck, who's a, a researcher from the UK, um, shared this. Uh, quote I'm going to read to you that is just one of my absolute favorite quotes from all of this research. She says, whether or not the gender development of children in lesbian families would be expected to differ from that of children in heterosexual families depends on the extent to which it is possible for parents to influence the gender development of their children. Now again, I said I have a 16-year-old and an 11-year-old. And I don't know how this is for all of you in your homes, but I don't know how much influence I have over my children regarding anything. You know, um, I, uh, I try to influence my children into values that I think are important. You know, my children's identity, whether it's regarding their Jewish identity, whether it's regarding how often they clean their rooms, 
whether it's regarding what I think of as healthy eating habits, whether it's regarding what I think are good moral or ethical values, or whether I think it's important to study uh, for their physics test. Whatever it is that I think is important or valuable is not necessarily the way that they see the world. I just don't know how much power I have to influence my children's development, my children's gender development. So leaving us with the questions, is it possible that children reared in homes with greater acceptance of gender flexibility are more likely to resist gender uh, stereotypical behavior? In other words, if you're, if you're in a home where there is a lot more fluidity, where your parents and your friends' parents exhibit more fluidity, is it likely that those kids are going to resist the stereotypes of our society in higher numbers? And I suspect that it is. I suspect that if they're seeing that, um, and one of the things that I notice as a therapist is that sometimes um, children who are gender variant um, are being raised in homes where the parents are very gender rigid. So they're coming to see me, a therapist, paying me money because they're concerned about things that I know would not concern me or friends of mine. So for instance, you know, their kid goes through a phase of showing up at the dinner table dressed uh, as a girl or wearing high heel shoes. And you know, I think, you know, in my house, you know, you know, Batman came to the table for a couple of weeks. That didn't really upset me. You know, there's periods when my kids were little when they were showing up sort of half naked at the dinner table because they didn't want to wear clothes. And pretty much we take all of that in stride. It didn't become an issue. But, you know, I remember one father who said to me, um, heterosexual man, who said, you know, my son keeps sneaking in to his sister's room to steal the Barbie dolls. And I keep yelling at him and putting them back in her room. And to me, the answer was just so simple. Just buy him some Barbie dolls, and he won't have to steal his sister's Barbie dolls. But the idea of buying a boy a Barbie doll was really inconceivable to this man. So can it be that our children, because they're raised in LGBTQ homes, will express greater gender fluidity? Does having same-sex parents actually create more positive attitudes towards homosexuality and therefore allows more exploration for their own same-sex relationships? And I think it does. Do children with same-sex parents question their own sexuality and gender with greater ease than their peers? And I want to share with you that that thought um, uh, was not mine. That was my son's. Uh, something he said to me at the age of uh, probably about 12 or 13, and actually what he said uh, while we were sitting in the van one day, he said, hey mom, you know how you told me there's all that research that says that gay parents don't make gay kids? Well, I don't think that that's true. I think what's true is that kids being raised in gay homes probably have more freedom to look at and think about their sexual identity at much younger ages than other uh, families do. And I, I suspect that that is true, and I suspect that that is a great difference that somehow the researchers did not see. Um, so I want to leave us thinking that all families address issues of gender. Um, all families. Although LGBTQ families face, face these unique pressures from the mainstream culture regarding how we model gender to our children. So this picture over here um, that you're looking at is uh, Dell again, who I mentioned earlier. And um, you know, it's a very sweet picture of a man holding uh, his newborn baby. Um, and uh, does it change how we view that if I say that it's a trans man holding his newborn baby? Or if I say that it's an intersex man holding his newborn baby? Um, so. Um, you know, what are the messages our children are getting about gender in our families? And how do we respond to the social pressure of, nor of uh, heteronormativity? So the world scrutinizes us. They're watching us. They're watching us and our children to see that our children are just like others. And I think the question we need to ask ourselves is how can we assist our children 
in developing healthy gender identities, whether or not they are normative or variant. So that's what I have to say. It's 7.27 according to my clock. So um, I came in three minutes early, uh, Claudia. Um, I think I deserve some chocolate for that. So um, I, uh, I think the next thing we're going to do is open this up for some questions. Is anybody Thank there? you, Ari. Okay. <laughs> I think that um, presentation gave us a lot to think about. I'm wondering if folks um, have questions they'd like to raise or comments. And Heather's telling me that she has a question. Ari, uh, folks would like to see slide number 20 again. <laughs> they didn't would. grab the site address or the article info quickly oh, sure. enough. Well, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this forward one slide. That's my cute family, by the way. And um, you have there my website and my email. So if there's anything that you want to uh, either ask me afterwards or information about anything about my books or about anything I'm doing, you can email me. But if you go to my website, you'll see that there is a page on my website that says, oh, something like writing. And then if you click on that, it says journal articles. And if you click on that, there's a whole bunch of journal articles. And the one that I had um, put up on the screen was called How Queer, uh, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity in the Children of LGBTQ Parents. And um, I just want to say that this was um, published in a very... Uh, mainstream and respectable journal called Family Process, and uh, I'm personally very uh, I'm thrilled that they wanted it. But um, it speaks to this issue uh, getting out there in the mainstream conversation more. Okay, we have another question. Uh, okay. You have to raise your hand like the little kid. That's right. How do you navigate defending your gender presentation to family when they challenge how you might affect your children? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, my first thought is, do we have to? Um, I mean, I appreciate that... Um, it's our family, and we want to have a dialogue or discussion with them. And I certainly am not suggesting that we shut down conversation. But I'm suspecting that the kind of conversation that the person who asked the question has probably gone on more than once. In other words, that it, it, at some point it doesn't become a question. It becomes a sort of berating or a challenging. And I don't necessarily think that we have to put up with tons of that. Um, I think that what we need to do is model pride in our um, interesting and unique gender identities. Um, but I think that the answer is, is that what I'm modeling for my children is authenticity. What I'm modeling for my children is that it is fully OK to be myself, and that I want them to be fully OK to be their self. And, and I also think I just want to reiterate, I think it's very important that we don't feel um, that we step out of the position that we have something to defend. OK, the next question is, uh, any tips for genderqueer or trans parents talking to their children about their own gender identity? Um, I guess my first question would be is, would the tips be different? What would be different that a trans parent or a uh, gender queer parent would say that would be different than what any parent, heterosexual, LGBT, would say. Because um, I think, we, I, you know, again, I think the messages ideally should be the same. And, you know, there's, there's nothing to me that's more exciting than, um, you know, we, we have a neighbors across the street, a straight family, and their daughter, who's about 12, was saying something to me the other day, and she said, well, you know, I think when I grow up and I fall in love, whether it's a boy or a girl, and she just kind of went on talking, and I just love that in a straight family, she's getting this very clear message that it's okay to love a boy or a girl, whoever you are is okay. So that's a different 
answer than about gender, but I think that the metaphor remains the same. So I think what might be more challenging for gender queer parents, uh, for butch moms, for sissy dads, and for trans parents is um, the questions of our own gender presentation. In other words, the, the, the cha I don't challenge is not quite the right word, but the, the dialogue that says, you know, it's okay for me to be gender queer in the ways I am, but it's also okay for you to be totally gender normative if that's who you really are. So, you know, so the, in other words, the kid is not getting a message that I have to be like you in some way, but the kid is getting a message that they can be completely and fully who we are. I think, and you know, this, I th you know, dives a little bit into the, you know, the next webinar that we're going to do about um, how children move through developmental stages, but some of it really depends on the age of the child. So, you know, the message to very little kids is kind of simply, you know, it's you know, to be free to be you and me and to uh, give them lots of examples of diversity. Um, but as children, you know, these questions get more complicated um, when children are uh, pre-teens and they're beginning to question uh, their own sexuality and their own gender and they're feeling a need for far more privacy from their family. They don't want to, you know, even though you may want to be a parent, whose kids can come to you to talk about everything or anything. They don't want to be a kid who's talking to you about everything. You know, my son has said those exact words to me. I know I could talk to you, but I don't want to talk to you. You know, this is just not something I want to talk to my mom about. So they start to get more private, which, you know, tends to make us a little uncomfortable, and, you know, what's going on and what's happening with them. Um, as they're starting to figure out who they are, and they also sometimes start to get embarrassed of us. So then it's where it becomes, you know, don't pick me up at school and don't kiss me in front of my friends, and I don't know how to explain you to my friends. Um, but as kids are developing more language, I think there's more opportunities to have more sophisticated conversations with them. And I'm a really big believer that um, in two things. In, one is that whenever a kid can voice a question, they can han handle the answer. So that's number one, is that if they, can, if they can find a way to ask the question, I'm going to answer it. And number two is some people say, you know, sh you should um, be cautious in answering questions, but I actually think that we should answer a little bit more than they ask, meaning that, you know, we seed the conversation with just a little bit of breadcrumbs that hints at where it might be going. You know, you know, some more information than they're actually asking. So um, I don't know if that was good enough tips or not. So if you want to ask a clarifying question, I'm happy to do that. Okay, the next question is, do you have any advice for young therapists working with LGBTQ families? Have fun. Um, do I have any advice for young therapists? Well, I, uh, young or old, I think that um, we are all in desperate need for more um, education. So I want uh, everyone to really put pressure on your universities and colleges to provide more trainings on LGBT issues. And you know that's the, the purpose of my sexual orientation and gender identity project I'm doing at SUNY. I think, Claudia, what I'll do is um, um, I'm assuming you have everybody's email. I'll send out a link to you for that that you can uh, forward on to everybody. Um, and uh, we are not yet providing webinars that people can download later, but we, um, uh, so you'd have to be vaguely within the upstate New York area to come. Um, so I think we need um, a lot more training. I think that, um, that it's really good if you can get um, a peer uh, consulting group together or if you can seek out consultation. Um, you know, in some ways, everything else that we're learning, I mean, couples are couples, whether they're gay or straight, but there are certain kinds of unique issues that um, gay men bring to therapy, that lesbians bring to therapy, that uh, bisexual people, whether they're in heterosexual or gay relationships, bring to therapy. 
and that the variety of uh, trans and gender queer identities bring into the therapeutic room that if you're not getting that special training or you're not having people to talk with about it, um, you can get, you can be very isolated around it. And I also think that we need to, all of us, not just therapists, but expand our uh, possibilities, our potentialities around gender to really understand the great diversity that is available to people around gender. Okay, and a it's, question. It's, yeah, it's hard. You no, know, it's okay. It's hard. Um, that you know, just the nature of the webinar is that there's sort of no feedback. I I don't see anybody's face, and I don't hear any feedback. So it's just hard to know if um I, I if I'm giving people what they're wanting. So I'm just putting that out there. Okay. Uh, branching off of that question, what is the best way to apply what we learned today in our work with LGBTQ clients? Okay, so that's obviously coming from a therapist, not a parent. Um, what is the best way to do that? Um, I would say that <clears throat> we need to start talking more about gender. So we need to not be afraid to ask the questions. I remember many years ago I was working with a couple. Um, I will uh, uh, visually to look at this couple, a lesbian couple, it was very obvious that one of them was uh, much more feminine in her dress and demeanor than the other one. And um, one was far more masculine, although they had never brought up that as a subject to discuss. Um, and there were uh, at one point, they were having um, an argument, and the argument had to do with what I, uh, and again, th these are my words, not the client's words, but what the butcher of the two women um, was wearing um, to go to court, and uh, the other woman felt really strongly that she shouldn't dress in a certain way and wear certain kind of clothing, and why don't you wear this, and you'll look better if you wear that. And um, it, it was so obvious to me that this was about gender. and Yet when I started to explore it as something that was about gender, they both denied that. You know, this has nothing to do with gender. I just, you know, kind of think she should wear a dress. <laughs> um, and I kind of pushed them, and it was a little uncomfortable to look at it. And um, it was, you know, as, as it evolved, um, what they began to talk about is the, the woman who was more feminine was really attracted to her partner's uh, masculinity. But she was really ashamed of that. She really thought there was something wrong with being attracted to that. And she wanted the partner to dress more feminine because that was more socially acceptable. Although she also thought she looked good the way she was dressed. Um, now luckily the butch partner you know, wasn't having any of it. And she was pretty clear in who she was and in her identity. Again, although she didn't use that label, that label didn't have meaning for her, she was really clear she wasn't about to put on a dress to go to court or anywhere else. Um, and it just was an interesting dynamic for me to see um, that something that was so obvious was so underground in their relationship. So what I'm suggesting is that we uh, talk about that more, that we are less afraid to bring these things up, to ask families how they're doing it, to ask them, how, you, know, you know, that question of how do you do gender? And, you know, what are the messages in this family about gender? You know, um, why do we say certain things about, you know, well, obviously, you know, little Bobby, you know, can't wear the Daphne outfit for Halloween. Why? Why can't little Bobby do that? And to not, to not be afraid to bring those questions out and to explore what I often think is under some of this, which is a sense of shame. It's a sense that, you know, if my kid is queer, if my kid is gay, if my kid is in some way breaking gender rules, then this is my fault because I'm a, I'm a queer parent myself and I've done this to my child. And, um, you know, we haven't done anything more to our children um, than, um, than uh, straight families have. I, I had a student a while ago come up to me after class and said to me, um, uh, he was trying to understand, he was a straight guy, and he was trying to understand something about butch femme roles. And I said to him, I said, you know, 
you know who the most rigid gender people are? You know, you know, people who are just so stuck in their gender roles, it's so hard for them to move. And he looked at me, you know, what do you mean? And I said, well, straight couples. You know, straight couples, you know, who believe that men have certain roles and women have certain roles and they shouldn't blend at all. And, of course, not all straight couples are like that. I understand that. But it, that's what it took for him to get it because he just couldn't get, like, why does this butch femme couple want to, quote, unquote, play those roles? And it was like, they're not playing roles any more than your mom and dad are playing roles. So I think that we need to start really opening up that dialogue. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Um, let's see. I have an eight-year-old transgender son who shares this information about himself fairly frequently with friends or talks about wanting all of his classmates to know about him. He can't tell me exactly why this is so important to him. Can you shed any light on why he feels the need to be so open about something that is still largely not accepted? Well, that's it. I, I, I'm, when you're saying you have an eight-year-old son, I'm assuming this is a boy who was born a boy who is feeling like a girl but not living as a girl. And I'm not trying to be complicated, but I, I'm just trying to understand if it is a child who has, who has socially transitioned their sex or a child who has that identity. I don't, is it possible to get a clarification on that, Heather, or is that too, too complicated? Uh, if they type in to clarify. Okay. So if you type in, let me know. And if not, I'll just start. I'll just keep talking until I get that information. Okay. So uh, the first thing I want to say is I think that that's great. I think that um, you know it, it's 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 great that a kid would feel so good about himself that he doesn't want this to be a secret. In the same way that um, you know I don't want my lesbianism to be a secret, and I am really fine uh, holding hands with my partner in the mall, and um, I really feel very proud of my family, not despite the fact that I'm gay, but because of the fact that I'm gay. So I, I think that you as a mom or dad who are sharing this should feel really, really proud of your kid, um, that, that it's not a secret, that it's not something that he's feeling ashamed of. Um, I, have and, an, I have an answer. Uh, okay. It's a biological girl living as okay. a boy. Okay, so the, then the question would be um, that, you know, it, perhaps that what the parent is feeling here is, you know, you've socially transitioned, like shush, you know, there's no reason to talk about this anymore, let's get on with it. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I, I don't think it changes one iota of what I just said. I think he's feeling proud of himself and his identity, but he's also maybe not wanting to... Um, you know, the secret can be very dangerous. And I, I work with a number of kids for whom um, it is more secretive, not totally secretive, but whenever it comes up, whenever the kids from third grade who knew him as a girl uh, feel a need to mention that in fourth grade or fifth grade, and frighteningly enough in middle school, um, he feels really outed. And so it's kind of a way to avoid anybody ever outing you and any and anyone making you a target for that. That would be my thought about that. I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think there's a lot of other things to worry about. I, I would take that one off my list. Okay, before I read the next question, I just wanted to mention that anybody who doesn't get an answer to their question, we will email the questions to Ari so that she can reach out and answer those questions. Um, I just want to add to that. Um, if you give her time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next question is, you asked the questions, question about how do we support our children with normative gender roles. Can you speak to that? We have a daughter who wears pink, adores princesses, and wants to take ballet. It feels like we are just giving in to marketing, but at the same time, is this normal for a young preschooler? to like because we don't know because we never like that stuff. <laughs> we also worry that princesses are only waiting for their prince and that message worries us. Yes, that's a great question. So um, it is difficult. Uh, I, I should probably do a caveat that I'm the mother of sons, not daughters. So um, probably you shouldn't listen to anything I have to say because um, it's one of those if you don't live it, you may not know it. 
So having, having said that, um, I think it's really difficult to discern what is marketing and what is, um, um, I don't know what you want to call it, true identity, authentic identity. Um, you know, I, I hear a similar question sometimes uh, from mothers of sons about superheroes. You know, what is this uh, intense interest in superheroes? You know, um, why does my son, you know, want to play games that involve fighting and war and battles? And I don't like that. So I think that both, uh, this may be surprising, but both princess games and Power Ranger games are both about power in the world. So if we can just for a second get rid of marketing, and uh, maybe we could get rid of marketing for a year, that would be good. But if we could just separate ourselves from marketing, I think that there are ways for young children to express femininity, masculinity, power in their bodies. Um, and again, if you're not the princess girl type, you may not completely get why that's about power, but as a femme, I get that, okay? So I get why um, being, um, being the princess and being the prettiest um, might be a form of power for some girls. Now, it is confusing because of marketing, so I think we have to deal with marketing the same way we do around, and I'm sure you do deal with it, around, um, uh, you know, crappy, sweet cereal that kids want to buy, or uh, the plastic junk toys <coughs> that they're fascinated with that break in 35 seconds. Um, and, um, you know, to, to, to continue a dialogue with them about, you know, what is being marketed and why. And I think there are a number of books out on the market that, you know, kind of uh, allow the princess, you know, to, um, to not just get the prince, but to uh, be powerful in her own right. And I would encourage those kind of stories. And if you're having trouble finding them, then write them. And if you're having trouble write them, then make them up. But to constantly expand on that message um, about, uh, again, the heteronormativity of the Cinderella story. Um, and, um, you know, because, you know, the princess gets to kind of rule the kingdom in a lot of ways. And, um, uh, that's not a bad message. And I don't, you know, I think that speaking as a lesbian uh, to perhaps other lesbians, I think that within the lesbian community, we've always had a disdain for all things feminine um, that uh, borders right on the edge of misogyny for me. So um, as much as I think that women should be strong and powerful, um, I also think that... Uh, uh, some of us express that in a more feminine style. And um, um, not saying you should necessarily encourage that. Plenty of social encouragement around that. But um, try not to be too afraid of it. And remember that it may not, it also may not have anything to do with heterosexuality either. So just bear that peace in mind too. I have, uh, remember some uh, friends of mine when they were little used to always um, who are actually both gay identified now, but when they were younger used to always um, um, do some kind of uh, you know, Cinderella meets Snow White sort of thing. And uh, the two uh, would sort of run off together and um, go play Whoopi behind the dollhouse. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it doesn't have to be a straight image either. Okay, and our final question is, what do you say to a child that wants to know why a relative has cut themselves off because of a parent's gender identity? So I guess, again, I'm assuming that what that means is somebody has, uh, one of the parents has come out as trans or is expressing a gender identity, and an outside relative has said, you know, I can't be a part of this anymore. I don't want to be a part of this. Um, so... I hope that's the right question. So, um, well, I would talk about sadness. I would talk about the decisions that other people make decisions in their lives that, you know, um, based on their own values, sometimes their own religious values, what they understand, and that it can be very sad for us that people do that. Um, I don't really know that we have to focus in on the gender identity question because I don't know 
that it's really ultimately any different if you are cut off because you're transsexual or if it's because um, you, uh, I'm trying to think of other things in our lives, you know, because somebody doesn't like the fact that you're a vegetarian or because somebody doesn't like, you know, that you converted um, and are practicing a different religion um, or they don't like the woman you married or all kinds of other things. I mean, family members cut each other off for all kinds of things. So I wouldn't focus in on the gender. I would almost shrug at that, you know, like, you know, I guess so-and-so just, you know, didn't like that about me, but I would really focus in on the loss issue and the sadness issue and why people make decisions that can be so hurtful not only to, to themselves but to, but to the person, you know, it, it's, in other words, it's not just hurtful to the transgender person who's being rejected, but in this case it's hurtful to this child who doesn't even understand. Um, and I would express it in a way um, uh, to try to have compassion for the other person's uh, inability to be more open-minded. Hi, this is Claudia. I want to thank everyone for participating. I especially want to thank our presenter, Ari, who never fails to inspire me um, with her thought-provoking statements and, and sharing the ways that she thinks of things that I've never thought of. So Ari, thank you for your generosity. Um, and I want to invite people to hang around um, and complete a short evaluation form, just seven quick questions so we get some feedback from folks about this webinar. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, um, Ari's mentioned it, the second of our Wednesday webinars will take place on March 7th, same time slot, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, the subject of our second webinar is talking with children in LGBTQ families about their origins across developmental stages. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and to working with you, Ari, I'm preparing for that, as always. Yeah, um, that's great. Um, if I can just say something on the feedback forms, um, I am a new, I'm a virgin webinar s, webinar, webinar mistress, so um, I am open to um, really hearing, you know, honest feedback about uh, am I talking too fast, am I talking too slow, should my slides be less busy, whatever it is that you want because um, it is difficult, it truly is difficult not getting the feedback that one normally gets where people sort of nod their heads and you know you're sort of connecting. So I'm pretending you're all nodding your heads, but for all I know you're throwing tomatoes at your screen. So uh, please feel free to um, uh, answer the questions honestly. I would appreciate that. Thank and you, thank everyone. Claudia. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Heather, for getting us through our first webinar. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Good night, everyone.